Thanks everyone for attending. Um, this is the first of a, a series of webinars we're going to be doing. Basically, what we did is we um, uh, let's go ahead and webinar plans here. We basically uh, have been discussing internally about our communication with the community, and uh, a lot of folks are really happy with the sorts of things that we communicate during the AGM. Uh, AGM is just once a year, though, and uh, we usually have a lot of stuff going on, of course, between those annual updates. And uh, we thought that between the um, the four of us dev leads, and I'll introduce us in a second, it would be helpful to host quarterly meetings, so four times a year, to go over some of the same sorts of materials that we present in the AGM, but just to uh, to do it in more of a fine-grained form. So first on introductions, uh, my name is Alex Smetcher. I'm the Associate Director of Development, is my title within PKP. But um, each of us on the dev team leads group here has uh, an additional title, which we can go through in a second. I am the infrastructure lead, and we've got here also Bojana and Nate and Danika. And maybe Bojana, I'll let you introduce yourself and then pass to Nate and Danika. Hello, I'm Bojana, Bojana and uh, in, located in Germany, and I'm the lead for the metadata and distribution team. Hi, everybody. I'm Nate Wright. I am based in Edinburgh in Scotland, uh, and I am the workflow lead, so uh, things involving mostly the editorial workflow. Hello, I'm Devika, and I'm based out of Mumbai, India, and I'm working as a UX UI designer, and I'm also conducting research in the process. Perfect. Thanks, everyone. Um, for the participants, I believe that you've got access to the webinar chat, so you can always ask questions in the sidebar, and I hope we have some time at the end of the presentation to go through those. So as those come up, um, feel free to drop them in, and uh, if the presenters can answer them in, in, as they come up as well if they're relevant, but uh, otherwise we'll try and get some time afterwards to go through them. Okay, um, so uh, we're going to jump right into the material here. I believe bojana has got some material on statistics for us to present. Yes, I will introduce the... Uh, Alec, you can jump to the next page. <laughs> Um, the, we refactored uh, usage statistic completely and implementing a few new features. For example, log entry format change. Now we use uh, internal JSON format that contains all information needed for easier processing. Um, instead of having one huge database table metrics, we now have several database tables for statistics data. For example, one for journal index page statistics, one for issue and issue galleries, one for uh, all submission statistics, etc. Some statistics data like count um, institutional and geo statistics aggregated monthly and depending on the settings, um, daily data can be or will be deleted. The user statistic is now in core. There is no plugin anymore. And it uses um, new technologies that we inter are introducing, like Laravel events and jobs. And the statistics data is accessed via API now. I like next page, it can go. Uh, presentation and reporting is now integrated with uh, UI. It is separated for different objects and report types. Uh, uh, soon you will see the screenshots. And uh, other reports like PKP user statistics report, view report, and custom report generator are removed. Uh, during the upgrade, all statistics data uh, with metric type or just counter is migrated from the database table metrics into the new tables. And other metric, uh, uh, metric types like some old ones or own used or some orphan data, uh, for example, for the objects that do not exist anymore, will st still stay in the old table metrics. Uh, now we collect um, geostatistics data only on the submission level, so that means only the data for that is migrated and the other geodata, for example, for issues will not exist anymore after the upgrade. Log file, uh, I regularly reprocess daily, but there is also tools that help uh, reprocessing of um, older files. Uh, for example, there is a tool for monthly reprocessing of the log files or a script that converts Apache log files into the new format or the log file format used in the pre-existing statistics plugin into this new 
format so that they can be reprocessed as well. Uh, next page, please. <laughs> uh, for the IP geolocation, we use IP to city light database in MMDB format provided by the DBIP and license under CC BY. And um, the database is automatically updated monthly, every month. Um, uh, regarding um, data privacy, the geolocation will be calculated on the fly at the usage event logging before the IP address is hashed and then the geolocation is also logged. Um, new is that um, we support now counter release 5. It is uh, considered for data processing and the sushi reporting. And it's also implemented in the core. Uh, uh, the existing uh, counter plugins uh, is still there and it supports only release four. The release three uh, is removed. Um, there is also support for the institutional statistics that also needed for the counter release five. There is possibility to manage, manage institutions and their IPs and this data is also then considered for usage event logging and the statistics are compiled only at the submission level and currently provided only via sushi reporting. Uh, next uh, page please. And here's a picture how article statistics page looks like now. New is the possibility to filter by issues and the button download report. I, I don't know if, if you can see it well. But when pressing all other filters and settings are the same, when pressing this button download report, uh, Alec, you can jump on the next page. For example, here's uh, what um, reports are um, exist for the article statistics. Uh, you can see here the filters you have selected and the um, reports type that are available. There is an um, article report that contains the number of abstract views and file downloads. It's pretty much the export of this listing from the page uh, below. Uh, then files report that contains the total number of downloads for each file. Uh, timeline report is the total views um, and downloads for each day or month, depending on what filter is selected. And um, maybe just to mention the numbers here are not reported for each article, but um, for all. So if one would like to have um, timeline for one article, one should first filter that article, for example, by searching for the title and then um, download the report. And geographic report contains the number of views and downloads for each country, region, or city, depending on the settings. Uh, yes, that would be all about statistics. Reporting. I will now also say something about changes in for DOIs uh, in the next release. Uh, Alec, you can go to the next page. Uh, the DOIs are now also implemented in core, so there is no PubID plugin anymore. The settings can be found under, under distribution settings page, tab DOIs. Uh, and the setup is pretty much similar to the one uh, of the pre-existing plugin. The, the new is the possibility to choose how the DOIs should be signed uh, automatically upon reaching the copy editing stage or upon the publication or manually. Uh, and the way this uh, default suffix is created now, it's a random six character uh, followed by a two digit checksum. And there is also still the possibility to use the pattern or to manually uh, add the suffix and everything will be uh, migrated correctly from the older versions. Alec, you can um, go to the next page. Now the DOI management settings are also in charge of choosing which registration agency will be active. Um, as till now, we support the three registration agencies, Crossref, Datasite and Mandra, but only one agency plugin can be active at the time. And here you can also choose to deposit DOIs automatically. Like next page, please. <laughs> 
so all DOI management is handled from the central DOI management management page that you see see here. Available via DOI is link in the navigation bar, left sidebar. Uh, the DOIs for articles and issues are handled separately via their individual tabs. And that means also that DOIs will no longer be assigned on the individual item settings page, but only here. Here, for example, all articles are listed. And in the extended article view, all article DOIs, for example, uh, also Galley's, Galley DOI, if, uh, if set so. Uh, can be viewed or manually edited, uh, as well as deposited manually. The same search is used um, in uh, in the submission management page is, uh, is available here. Um, submissions can also be filtered by an issue. And of course, DOI filtering by the status is still possible. Uh, the next page, please. <laughs> The bulk actions, there are uh, bulk actions that can be used or, uh, and applied on selected items. Items can be selected individually or using the select all um, action. Um, it can be, they, those bulk actions can be used to mark the registered or unregistered or stale, to export XML file or to, sign or to assign or deposit DOIs. There is also a button deposit all that would consider all items for deposit that meet the requirements. For example, if published, um, if the item is published and it if it has a DOI assigned to it. If an error message is returned when depositing the DOI, it would be sh shown up here. You can you would be seen here. It will be stored and uh, provided here. Um, Yes, I think that's it. And on the next page, there are some implementation details for you if um, interested. Uh, but yes, that would be all about the statistics and UIs. Of course, everything will be documented and uh, hopefully all clear then from the documentation. Well, Sharon, there's a couple of questions coming in that we might take while we're at it. Um, but the, the mm -hmm. chat was disabled. It's now been enabled, so you can add questions. Uh, the first one here is from Jim about the DOI settings. Will they be migrated in the plugin or from the plugin, or will they have to be set up again? I think the the ones that that are there, it, there, there will be migrated. And there's a second question from Jim as well about how long the upgrade script would take for migrations. Um, I'll speak about migrations a bit later in upgrades and we do upgrade testing on larger installations. So we hope to identify upgrade problems and delays uh, in advance of the release this time. I know the 3.2 to 3.3 uh, um, upgrade process was quite prolonged in some cases. And we've made some definite progress there. But Jenna, do you know any comment on the specific uh, migrations for upgrading the um, statistics, the metrics? Uh, there, there can it can take a long. I I don't have numbers here from my tests locally, but it is a, a bigger, a, a bigger upgrade. So maybe I can. Um, uh, I I have I don't have numbers, but it means a little bit longer. We we do. But a smaller installation is not a problem, but if it's a big one. <laughs> Yeah, we do test with a large installation that, uh, in fact, it's CLO's uh, uh, partnership mm -hmm. with us provides us with a lot of information that we can use to provide testing on large installations. And the 3.2 to 3.3 upgrade process took a solid week to run on a considerably sized server. And that was a definite learning experience for us. And um, we've since brought the migration process, this is the whole upgrade process for 3.3 to 3.4, down to maybe half an hour, maybe an hour for a large installation. But we have to make sure that we do proper coverage on all of that as part of the release process when we've got all of the various upgrade steps in place and are just doing last minute cleanup. Um, see a couple more comments here. Uh, Amanda, is the DOI functionality still managed by a plugin or is it built in and then sends information to whatever DOI register plugin is enabled? Uh, this, uh, it's not the plugin, so not the other one. <laughs> answer okay and i see mark asking about uh, ip anonymization yes it's you it's using a, it's anonymized it's using a salt that changes uh, daily so it cannot be and um, 
hashing algorithm algorithm S S H A two hundred six fifty six, and so it cannot be re recalculated again to the IP address, the hash that you say. Perfect. Keep the questions coming. Um, in the meantime, let's move on to uh, some talk about upgrades in LTS. And um, this is a big subject for us, as we saw it just came up. And I've been doing a few presentations about this over the last year or so. Um, it does bear some repeating. So if you've seen this presentation before, this is just a quick uh, summary of the same thing. But the point I want to make is that we've put a lot of effort into the upgrade process, starting with the 3.3.0 release, so the last couple of years, and going forward. And if you're still on 3.1, 3.0, 2.x, then you're still unfortunately dealing with the older upgrade code that has a number of issues that, that make it difficult to upgrade. If you can just get yourself to 3.3, the future will be a lot brighter for that. But I want to talk also about LTS releases. Um, so this is a, 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 a graph from a data set that we published twice now. It's, um, it's We call it internally the beacon, but basically this is information on the worldwide set of OGS users and also OMP and OPS. Um, one of the things we can use, uh, we can get from that data set is the deployment of various versions of OGS. So uh, this is a slightly different view than things were a year ago. A year ago, 3.2 is the major version and 3.3 was creeping up. Since uh, then, 3.3 is now the dominant version, which is great because that is our first LTS or long-term support release. And we, we've committed to maintaining that for a period of three to five years. And as I say, once folks are on that version, the upgrade process will get a lot smoother. But we still do have a number of folks on 3.2, 3.1, and 2.4. And I know Alejandra and Juan Pablo Alperin and a few others have been doing work, um, I believe Jason Nugent in Morocco, just to make sure that the community has the resources they need to be able to upgrade. Um, that's more of a community stewardship process than the dev team and the dev team speaking to you now. So we're focused on 3.3 and onwards. Um, but as you can see, we're now getting to the point where 3.3 is the most common release. Um, the challenges that are causing these folks to uh, stay on the older releases can be solved. We're, we're applying three different approaches to uh, to to solve it. One is to Im Im upgrade the or improve the um, upgrade process to make it faster, more reliable. Add some pre-flight checks in to make sure that if something's going to fail, it fails early, as opposed to taking three days and then having you stop and have to restart. Um, we're also adding some automatic upgrade testing, and that's part of our development tool set to make sure that when someone makes a change on the dev team that causes an upgrade problem to uh, to to, to uh, show up, that we identify it right away and fix it, as opposed to doing that at the end of the release cycle where it's a lot uh, uh, more time consuming for us to figure out what the change was and to make sure it's covered well. And then the third one here is long-term support, and that's a, a line of releases I'll talk about in a minute. Um, so just briefly, the way the upgrade process works is um, you've got three major components to your installation. You've got the, the software, the code, You've got the files area, which is where you store your submission files, your Word documents, your PDFs, all that sort of thing. Then you've got your database, which is a hundred and some tables that uh, capture all the workflow information and so on. So when you go from an older version to a newer version, you need to bring in the new software package. And that package includes the upgrade code to bring the database uh, and sometimes also the files area from its old structure into its new structure from the old release to the new release. Um, in previous releases to 3.3, so 3.2 and older, going back all the way to OJS uh, 2.0, we used a third-party library called ADODB, which allowed us to describe the database structure in a single format that then could be applied to both MySQL and Postgres and, and also MariaDB databases. Um, it was a very helpful tool for us, but it did not age very well. And uh, the emergent results of us using that tool to structure our upgrades then just led to a lot of um, people running into data problems. Um, with ADODB, we would have a series of pre-updates and we would apply that XML schema that uh, describes the database structure. And afterwards we'd run the, uh, the, the post-update scripts. And essentially it means that the upgrades are mixed. We first run 3.0, 3.1, 3.2x, something or other. Then we apply the schema and then we go back and run 3.0, 3.1 and 3.2x, something or other. Because those are intermixed, it's not just a linear progression from older to newer. Um, if you made a change in this 3.2.x pre-upgrade script, you really had to know what was happening in all the subsequent scripts. And so it meant that the dev team had to internalize a lot of the knowledge about um, old changes. And uh, it just led to um, frequent chances for problems to be introduced. It also means that the schema, which is only applied once here, has to accommodate all the upgrade steps. And so if data is being shifted from one place to another, it might be necessary to leave uh, a spare column or a spare table around for the data to be shifted around. And it just led to uh, just a lot of potential for mess. 
starting with 3.3.0 and going forward into 3.4 and so on, um, we've moved to a structure called migrations. And migrations are, um, it's more a conceptual tool. It's not a particular tool. Um, various uh, uh, application frameworks provide a migration tool set using the same sort of metaphor. Um, we've gone with uh, the, the Laravel tool set, but migrations apply to basically any modern piece of software that needs to upgrade. Um, these are applied in a linear fashion. So you apply all of your 3.3.x migrations, then you apply all your 3.4.x migrations, and they're bundled in a way that you can sort of forget about the older stuff unless you have to fix something particular there. We also have added this concept here of pre-flight checks, and this is at the beginning of every set of potentially destructive migrations. So at the start of the upgrade from 3.3.x to 3.4.x, we run a series of checks here that try to identify, is there going to be something that's going to cause the upgrade to fail? And if so, we stop before we even begin. And then we say, here's an issue, can you please solve that? And then uh, as opposed to the cycle you'll be familiar with if you've done OGS upgrades, where you, um, you try the upgrade, it fails, you restore from backup, you try it again, it fails, you restore from backup. Um, this process allows you to um, try again without restoring from backup. Um, you should always take a backup, of course, but you'll get a warning before anything destructive happens, and it just makes it a lot more reliable. And those checks allow us to be a lot more stringent about the kind of data conditions that we've got. Whereas over the years with so many releases and using the ADODB tool set, um, it's quite possible for the database structure to have wandered off in certain directions. Um, this is a lot, a lot more strict with it. Um, I mentioned automated upgrade testing, and this is a view of the, um, the Travis testing. Travis is the VM tool set that we use for automated testing. And it runs a tool called Cypress for integration testing. It runs some PHP unit tests for unit testing. It also runs this set of tests at the bottom here for upgrade testing. Essentially what this does is this, um, for every change that we make to the software, it runs through a set of around a dozen um, upgrade tests. What this does is it takes um, a copy of a database that was saved uh, from a previous um, branch of the software and tries to upgrade from that to the new, um, the new branch of the software. So we've got upgrades from 3.2.x to 3.3.x, 3.1.x up, 3.0.x up. We don't have 3. 0, uh, 3. No, we don't have 2.x uh, included because that's been removed from the, the current main branch, but essentially it's everything else, um, everything that's, that's got an active community working. So again, the goal here is to have a breaking change identified uh, quickly through an automatic process, rather than have us do at the very last stage some kind of spotty um, upgrade testing that's likely to leave out a version or miss a problem. Um, the last piece of this is uh, around the LTS strategy. So I mentioned LTS is long-term release. Um, what uh, We used to release software in this kind of linear fashion. 3.0 comes out, 3.1 comes out, 3.2 comes out. Each one of these introduces a bunch of new features and uh, certainly a, a number of new bugs as well. Um, the community would typically wait until after a release came out, maybe for a couple of months before taking the leap to upgrading to it because there was a sense that the software wasn't all that stable at the beginning. And the work on automated testing we're doing is looking to improve that. Um, we have made some improvements, but there's more to do, of course, but uh, uh, it wasn't clear which of these was really reliable or ready. Um, so we've now introduced uh, this dual release strategy where we have both uh, a more rapid, uh, kind of one year to the next upgrade strategy. If you need to have um, the latest and greatest, the newest features, all that sort of thing, then you can certainly continue to do that process. So you'd go 3.3, 3.4, 3.5, 3.6. Um, but we also have this slower process, especially for folks who have a hard time finding the tech resources to perform the upgrades. They'll be able to leap from one LTS release to the next LTS release. And the span of time between those is three to five years. And at the point at which we designate a release to be an LTS, when 3.3.0 came out, for example, it wasn't tagged an LTS release until I think the seventh build or something. When we internally and amongst community uptake we're really satisfied that it was a stable, um, reliable, uh, something we could stand behind for a long time. So that'll allow you to plan for a three to five year release cycle. And um, we're hoping that the contract we can establish with, with you folks in the community is that we are decreasing the amount of effort required to perform the upgrades. We're hoping that you're able to jump onto doing the upgrades. And so that wide distribution of um, different releases being used in the wild becomes a much smaller set. We'll see a lot of folks using 3.3, We'll see a few folks in the middle here using 3.3536. When 3.7 comes out, folks can reconcile. We can deprecate the 3.3 LTS release and have folks move on to 3.7. Um, those are just example numbers, by the way. But uh, the idea here is that we're no longer needing to support such a wide set of, uh, of releases. And especially for folks who are doing things like uh, writing third-party plugins, they can target an LTS release knowing there's a huge community there. They don't have to worry about um, making it compatible with, with all the various uh, releases out there. 
Um, so takeaways, please upgrade to 3.3.0. It is worth it. It's a very stable release. It's going to be good for a while. And we put a lot of effort into the upgrade process. So once you get there, it's going to be a lot easier. And then, yeah, make your choice. Choose an annual or a three to five year release cycle and then see what suits you best. Um, if you need a new feature, you can always hop over to the newest release. But if you need that slower pace, then the LTS releases will do that for you. I see a question here. Um, any thoughts on building and testing on ARM64, ARC64, so we can take advantage of cheaper cloud compute costs? Um, because we're using um, PHP, MySQL, it's a fairly high level stack. Um, it'll run on anything. So um, I don't actually know what the Travis test environment is, but the, the question of, of architecture doesn't really play into it. Um, by the time it gets to a PHP application, it can run on anything. It'll run on a Raspberry Pi, it'll run on a, a high-end server, it'll run on my laptop here. So uh, you're good to go on that sort of resource. I think there's some question around uh, uh, file systems and those sorts of things. And I, I'm not experienced with um, like Amazon cloud architecture and so on. I'm sure there's folks out there who, who probably have more experience than I do who might comment on their, um, their abilities with OJS. Uh, Mark's asking, is it possible to reconcile from 3.5 to 3.7? Yeah, as long as you're upgrading in a forward path, um, you can't go from 3.5 down to 3.4. We don't do downgrades. But if you're going from, uh, let's say, this 3.5 here, which is on the, the annual release cycle, up to a 3.7, that's absolutely possible. If you're on a 3.3 and it's doing well for you, and then a new feature comes out in 3.6 that you really want to make uh, take advantage of, you can hop from 3.3 to 3.6 directly. So as long as you're moving downwards on this track here, you're good. Okay, uh, I want to talk for a few minutes about modernization. Um, and this is uh, some, some backend code stuff, but this is really important for us to invest in as well because um, the language moves ahead, uh, developers move ahead, um, things evolve, and we have this large, quite uh, established code base that we have to pull along with it. Um, so one thing we've introduced with 3.4 is uh, PHP namespacing. So previously, um, we did not use namespacing. All of the classes that were in the software were in the same namespace. And we often saw problems with this where a new version of PHP would introduce a new class that happened to have um, the same name as one of our classes. And then all of a sudden we'd have to rename our class, make a new release and, uh, and work around it. But this is also a really useful organizational tool for, for the source code. Um, it also allows a number of um, downstream improvements. Uh, one of them is right here on class auto loading. Um, defining the namespace here uh, allows us to get rid of all these import statements, which was a, a very unusual workaround that just reflects on how uh, how old the OGS code base is. Um, when namespaces were introduced and class loading was introduced, this sort of um, import statement was was a, a relic of the past. And so we finally been able to get rid of this stuff. Um, the same applies to um, uh, constant names. I know a number of you have run into problems where the right class file is not loaded when you try to use a constant that's defined in it. And that's also gone away with uh, with the introduction of class loading. Um, we've also just added something that's uh, it's, um, it's been a feature of databases for, for a long, long time. And I'm surprised we're only just adding it now in the 21st century, but we didn't previously define uh, foreign keys in a way that the database would then uh, uh, apply referential integrity to. So let's say we have um, an entry in the submissions table, we've got an entry in the publications table, it then refers on to authors, other tables, et cetera. Um, if you've got a set of values in submissions, uh, let's say you've got a, a submission that refers to publication ID 580, but that entry doesn't exist in the publications table, you get uh, inconsistent data and then uh, downstream you'll get fatal errors where uh, the source code will assume that some data exists when it actually doesn't. So adding foreign key definitions in the database level allows us to, um, to get MySQL or Postgres to enforce that the data is consistent. So it's no longer possible to have an entry in submissions that refers to a non-existent publication. Um, this has just a, a huge number of downstream effects, but the, 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 the most important one that you'll see is when you're doing upgrades, you'll no longer see fatal errors where there's data missing. If you are looking at your, um, your event log, sometimes that will just uh, appear to freeze and never load. It's because of referential integrity. All that stuff's uh, cleaned up. Um, but also it allows us to do one really nice thing here, which is to publish a schema diagram because there's a tool called Schema Spy that we're using now to generate a series of diagrams and self-documentation for the database. So if you've ever tried to code with the database, you found that there's a very old manual that we released um, a decade ago and then not much else. Um, this is finally answering that question by allowing for the database to describe itself appropriately and then for a tool like Schema Spy to be able to uh, draw out and condense some documentation. So Starting with 3.4, we'll be publishing this as well um, so that uh, you'll be able to browse the schema documentation like you would the API documentation. 
Um, next up, I believe this is Nate on editorial decisions and extensibility. Um, any questions before? I think I've answered both questions that came up. Uh, please keep them coming. Hey, everybody. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about editorial decisions and new UI for editorial decisions. Um, this is one of our kind of big end user facing features that's, that's going into 3.4. Uh, our objectives with this were there were three kind of main objectives. One was just to bring uh, that part of the system over to a new uh, UI library, which is powered by Vue.js, a more modern build system, uh, part of that modernization drive that Alec just talked about. Um, the other the other objective was uh, to improve the UX, the user experience of, of recording these decisions. Uh, it's quite a central part of the editorial workflow in the platform. Uh, so we had a number of things we wanted to bring to, to help guide users uh, or editors along the process of recording those decisions, as well as uh, how they send and, and draft emails. And then the last objective was um, more of a code thing around uh, making the editorial decisions more extensible uh, and flexible for third-party plugins and things like that. Uh, next slide, Alec. Uh, so this is what the new UI looks like for uh, when an editor accepts a submission and sends it to copy editing. Uh, you'll notice there, there, there's a step-by-step -step wizard um, uh, to help guide the editors through it, uh, as well as a number of sort of places throughout the UI where we can uh, provide some text guidance on what, what the editor ought to do at this step. Um, this is the new kind of email composer UI that we've implemented. Uh, there's a whole lot that went into this email composer UI. It's, it's not, uh, but for 3.4, it's only used in editorial decisions, but we plan to roll it out to the system. Um, and there's been a, an enormous amount of work under the hood to structure how we manage email templates. Um, and uh, Vitaly has done, has done the bulk of that work, so I want to give him some, some credit for that. Uh, you'll notice on the left that there are a few email templates there that can be loaded. Uh, so with each email sent as part of an editorial decision, a journal can uh, edit the default email template or add additional templates. So in this example, uh, there are three different templates, one for just a stock uh, acceptance email, one for when you want to accept the submission, but you also want to request the author submit their data set to somewhere, uh, and then one where you need to request some kind of license waiver or some other sort of um, editorial requirement. Uh, so the idea is that a journal will be able to go in and kind of create as many email templates as they need to sort of fit the different circumstances uh, and, and messaging that they need to send out to people. Um, we've also got, I'm not gonna show everything about this email composer because we'll we'll talk about it a lot more when we actually get to release, um, but you'll see that you can attach files. We've made that a little bit easier. Um, we've designed the whole thing to look and feel and act more like just sending an email um, rather than working through a web form system. Um, and then if you look kind of on the bottom left under the templates, you'll see a little language switcher. So if you typically work in one language, but you know that the person you're emailing typically works in another and you prefer to send that email in that language, uh, this is a little tool that will uh, let you switch the email to that language. And this will be based off of um, the, the journal's supported languages. Uh, and I've said journal a lot, but this applies for uh, open monograph press as well as open preprint systems. Um, but we, we just tend to often talk about OJS. Um, next slide. Uh, so this is just step two as part of the process. Um, this one is a, as an email to send to, to reviewers. Um, one of the things I want to point out here is it, it, you may or may not be able to read the email very easily from where you're at. Um, but when you go to actually uh, write this email, you'll see that many of the sort of email template variables are already rendered. So you're, you're looking at the email as the recipient will see it. You'll see things like the submission title is in there, uh, the journal name is in there, what the actual decision was, that sort of thing. Um, so uh, there's been a lot of work done by uh, Kate Shuttleworth, as well as our, our friends at Open, Open Academia to um, rewrite a bunch of our default email templates to make them more informative, uh, to make the language that's used in them more warm uh, and welcoming and friendly. Uh, and uh, that's that's getting rolled out uh, primarily around the editorial decisions and, and that sort of stuff. Um, 
Yeah, next slide, Alec. And then this is just the last step with file promotion. Uh, so if you're familiar with the workflow, you know, typically an editorial decision will go uh, and take files from one stage and move them to another stage, for example, from review to copy editing. Uh, so this is just the final step where editors will select what files they want to send to the next stage. Um, so every editorial decision kind of has its own steps. Some of them have very few steps. Some of them have very many. Uh, it also adapts to the to what's actually happening. So if you didn't actually assign any reviewers uh, and you go to record and accept decision, that step just won't exist. Um, similarly, if you're you know if you're working with say an editorial and you have no authors assigned to that submission uh, as to the participants in that submission, that step won't appear. Um, and one of our goals with this is to make the whole system more adaptable and help us sort of bring in more features in the future. Uh, for example, one of the one of the big ideas we want to move forward with in the future is, is integrating uh, assignments into the process. So uh, when an editor sends a submission to the review stage, maybe as part of this same workflow, they're asked to uh, uh, select and assign uh, a certain number of reviewers. Uh, or when accepting the submission and sending it to copy editing, maybe they're asked to assign the, the copy editor right there. Uh, and hopefully that will help uh, link up all the different stages of the workflow and guide editors through that process a little better. Um, we also want to make the, the system more extensible for third-party developers um, who want to integrate uh, third-party systems or custom workflows into the system. Uh, one example would be uh, file conversion. Uh, that's a place that doesn't have a doesn't have a good place to live right now in our UI, um, but we're hoping that uh, that's the sort of thing people might work into the new editorial decisions process, either as adding it as a step to an existing submission or sorry existing decision, uh, or creating their own decision for that. Um, and I'll I'll go ahead and do a quick walkthrough, kind of a code on the code level of what it would look like to create a, a custom decision. Uh, next slide, Alec. So every editorial decision is now defined by a class in PHP. Um, and, and again, this is, this is primarily for developers and, and plugin developers. Uh, if it looks foreign to you, don't worry. A user is not expected to be, be do, working with this. This is just for developers who want to, to build custom uh, integrations. So every decision is a class. Uh, in this bit of code, all I've really done is set up some of the boilerplate, the, the labels, the log entries, all those sorts of uh, messaging that goes around an editorial decision. Uh, next, next slide, Alec. Uh, and then in this one, you'll see that um, there is, so basically this is just the function that you'd add to a, a editorial decision class to uh, create a, a step, a new step in the, the editor decision uh, with a custom form. Um, and I haven't included the code here to actually create that form. Uh, we have a nice little form builder system. It's in 3.3 already. Um, so some of you might be familiar with it. If not, uh, it's already on our developer documentation at our docs hub, so you can take a look there. Um, and then the one last thing you'd really need to do, uh, next slide, is there's also a, a method for each class to what we call run additional actions. So when someone records an editorial decision, uh, the system's automatically gonna take that decision and it's gonna log it in the database and everything. Um, but when you say want to send an email uh, as part of that decision or want to take some other kind of action, uh, like for example, the uh, sending, maybe sending documents to a typesetting program, or something like that, then you would just hook in or add this method to, to hook in here um, and uh, pull out that form data. Uh, so where you see action ID on uh, line 19, uh, that's gonna point you to the form data for the form that you set up. Uh, and you can pass that, that information into, um, into whatever, whatever third-party system you, you want to work with at that point. Uh, so uh, this is all we've got in terms of documentation for now, but but by the time 3.4 is out, we'll have sort of full documentation on how to work with the editorial decisions uh, thing, both as a, as a plugin developer or like to create new decisions or to um, or to modify existing ones. That's it for me. 
It's going to take a minute to go through a couple of questions here. So Jim was asking about um, adding referential integrity and uh, suggesting that he's concerned that his database will fail those checks. Pretty much every OGS user, OGS, OMP, and OPS, if we just added the referential integrity checks, uh, would fail. Um, so a lot of the work that's gone into the pre-flight checks is to make sure that we clean up the data uh, in advance. Um, it's almost always something that's cleaned up transparently. So you can just run it and it'll clean up your database and you'll be good to go with the additional benefits of the referential integrity checks. There's one or two cases where it's not possible for us to do that cleaning manually. I think one example is if you've got um, submissions that are uh, that are attached to non-existent sections. We don't simply want to remove those or force them into a different section. That's where we'd flag you as a user and say, hey, you've got some uh, content that needs to be fixed. We guide you through where to look for, for the data, how to fix it, and then you'd be able to rerun the, the process to upgrade it. But that's only for one or two rare cases. For the most part, it's done for you. The other question is um, PHP namespacing and how, how it's going to affect third-party code like plugins. All of this is backwards compatible. So right now, um, we introduce class aliases for all of the built-in uh, classes so that uh, you can still refer to them in the root namespace and they'll still work. Uh, our hope is that we can um, introduce that, document the steps to improve uh, your use of um, namespaces internally, and then uh, in time, uh, deprecate and remove those aliases. But for the moment, you'll be kind of carried through that process. Um, and then there's, uh, yeah, some praise of the decision type stuff. Um, keep those questions coming. Uh, I'm gonna move on to 3.4 release plans uh, at the moment. Um, so this is the roadmap and I probably should have started with this because this uh, does provide some justification for why we're working on the editor decision process, why we're working on counter R5, the stat stuff, all that sort of thing. But this is published publicly. And you can always refer to it. And this provides you with a very high level um, view of what's coming out in 3.4. Um, there's also a tab here called Milestones, which um, provides the uh, the release dates, the estimated release dates. You'll see on here, we've got 3.4 estimated for the first quarter of 2023. That means uh, if it's gonna be, if it's gonna happen in the first quarter, it'll be likely at the end of the first quarter. So March-ish. Um, we're just on the fence of potentially delaying the 3.4 release to the second quarter. And the reason for that's because we're about to enter the crazy season and uh, a number of us are gonna be away. And then the release process itself takes um, most of a month to uh, to complete, just with all of the various testing rounds, documentation, all that kind of thing. And I'd encourage you, if you're interested in, in participating in that testing, we will put out a call for the community to, uh, to do their own testing. That will help us to ensure that when 3.4 is released, it'll work really well for your data, your use cases. So uh, please join us with that. Watch for an announcement. Um, that'll happen in uh, the first quarter for sure. We may not quite get everything wrapped up for the first quarter, and so the release may come out in the second quarter. Um, and then these further uh, dates here are just estimates for the uh, subsequent releases. Um, this is uh, an old diagram. We have a new diagram that uh, Divika and others and Nate uh, especially have worked on, but this is nice because it gives everything in just a single page. But we're at the end of all the major development processes. So if you look at the, um, the roadmap, all of the big tasks that are flagged for 3.4 are essentially finished. Um, we're now into a number of small fixes. Let me begin this two release candidate cycle where the first release candidate gets built and then tested internally so that we catch any uh, major issues that are likely to crop up immediately with uh, community testers. And we build a second release candidate then uh, that's then sent out for anyone to, um, to test. And there's all different kinds of testing you can do there. There's upgrade testing, there's testing with your own third-party code and plugins, there's testing with your data, there's exploring new features for feedback. All of that's absolutely welcome and we will provide some guidance on how to do that. And then once all these parallel processes, this is quite an intensive uh, period of time. Once all those finish, we have um, this release notebook and the release, and then a bit of additional work for plugins to just come up to date uh, after that happens. So that's going to be the whole of the first quarter, potentially a bit of the second quarter for us. Um, I'd like to uh, return you over to Divika and introduce her as well. She's, um, we've never had a designer on staff before, which uh, considering how long PKP has been around um, is kind of hard to imagine. We're really excited to have somebody in this role now, and she's just really impressed us so far with, with her uh, creativity of thought. She comes from a background that is not um, publishing software, but from, from software, uh, the software industry in general. And she's really picked it up and run with it really quickly. So I'm excited to introduce her to you and to give her a moment to go through some of the stuff she's been working on. Thank you so much, Alec. Um, if you could move on to the next slide. Like Alec mentioned, I'm a designer who has recently joined PKP, but a lot of my effort would be uh, concentrated on engaging with the community and trying to bring 
about the voice of our users to our prioritization process. So prioritizing features is important because it simplifies the design and development process by continuously delivering features which are essential for the users and helps them achieve their goals faster. It also helps grow the product in a way which helps break the glass ceiling in the industry through sustained innovation. And in our effort to identify user priorities better for the next releases, we will continue to study the industry requirements, go through feature requests coming our way from our users, along with actively engaging with the community and collating user research to aggravate the user voice in our development process. If you could move on to the next slide. So um, there are some efforts we have been and are going to undertake to actively engage our internal and external stakeholders along with anal um, you know, analyzing the industry. Some of the efforts that we have taken or will continue to take would be usability tests, quantitative insights on submission lists, persona building workshop, heuristic analysis, competition audit, user workshops, and a lot of internal stakeholder workshops. Um, if you could move on to the next slide. And for starters, what I'll do is I'll walk you through some insights and snapshots from uh, some workshops we undertook in the months of September, October, and November. Um, Alec, if you could move on to the next slide. So one of the first tests that we did was usability tests for editorial decisions. Usability test was nothing but basically evaluating the editorial decision by testing it with representative users. So if you can go on to the next slide. So some of the users we interviewed uh, were from um, America, Europe, and Asia. Um, most of the roles that we targeted were journal managers and editors and who were using different versions of OJS3. Um, most of them were greatly familiar with OJS and uh, there was somewhat an equal divide between um, Spanish speakers and English speakers in our quest to understand how translation efforts would work. You could also see some of the journals and institutions these users were a part of. Um, Alec, if you could move on to the next slide. Um, the task that we had asked the users to perform were to accept submission in the review state, send a submission for review, resubmit the sub submission, and decline a submission. Um, if you could move on to the next slide. And some of the recommendations uh, that we received were uh, some participants suggested that we should separate notification from editorial decision. Um, and this issue was raised because there was a confusion with how the workflow was going and which files were being shared. Um, hence, um, we recommended that uh, we uh, work on decreasing the confusion in the workflow and making the features in the interface more intuitive. Notifying users would help create an atmosphere of transparency that most participants agreed to that. Um, some of the other recommendations were automatically notifying users would be a great feature, as some participants mentioned, it would decrease the load from the editors, whereas some others felt that, you know, um, the editors would lose control over the messages and communication that we were being sent. So we've decided to undergo a little more user and industry research on this in order to figure out how to implement this. Then most participants raised an issue with current experience and interface of discussion feature. They wanted it to be similar to Slack and other messaging platforms they were using with respect to clear indication on status messages, notification when a new message was received, history and the participants involved. Um, and this is something that uh, we would take forward, but we'll be working on in the future releases post more research that we'll be doing on this. Um, they also wanted the email template and the feature and the editorial decisions to be a little more intuitive, contextual, and informative. And the lastly, most participants suggested that the interface of submission workflow was not clear. Um, they were they were found struggling to understand uh, what part of the uh, submission the manuscript was in. Um, so we recommended to work on workflow stages indicator a little more clearly and maybe reordering the components uh, in our future releases. If you could move on to the next 
uh, slide. So I think Nate walked you through brilliantly to this, but these were some of the mockups that um, we created based on the recommendation. And I think they were beautifully translated. Um, and which brings me to the next um, uh, bit that we did. Alec, if you could move on to the next slide. Uh, if you could move on. <laughs> Sorry, is that the right one? My fault. Uh, the next after this. Yeah, so basically we did, um, the next thing that I did was persona workshop. Basically we reached out to a lot of internal and external partners at PKP to help us um, you know, figure out different user groups and their pain points, motivations, um, what their priorities and objectives look like so that every feature that we implement in the future or design, we can always look from their perspective and, you know, try ticking most of their needs and wants. If you could go on to the next slide, Alec. Um, so, of course, um, I'll make this accessible, but for now, um, some of the personas that we created were institutional users, publishers, editors, and admins. Um, I have tried putting their superpowers, which is basically how PKP could help, uh, could utilize these personas and, you know, that how they could help us grow. Uh, people, they influence their needs, requirements, pain points, um, objectives, goals, and motivations. If you could move on to the next one. The other two personas that we covered were reviewers and authors. And I would really like to thank each and everybody who participated in this workshop to make it a success. Um, if you could go on to the next slide. And lastly, uh, we did quantitative research for submission lists. So a lot of time editors or people with multiple roles in the journal were using submission lists to identify which submissions needed action. But sometimes these lists were getting so long and it was getting difficult for editors to filter the submission they needed. Uh, hence, to complete the task more quickly, editors wanted us to provide more tools to find these submissions easily. And in our pursuit to design these tools uh, to filter certain kind of submissions from others and help users, we were exploring the possibility of incorporating views and statuses, which are very similar to like uh, the views and statuses you use to filter things on Google or any e-commerce website. If you could go on to the next slide. Um, the research and the input that I coll collected through uh, the research and the survey that I posted uh, was, uh, as you can see, they wanted um, a waiting participant and um, assignment. They wanted, um, you know, a list to be filtered based on um, actions required by different roles, uh, by date, newest to oldest or by oldest, and you know, or vice versa. If you could move on to the next one. Um, so the users that participated in this basically were from South America, Europe, Africa, and North America. Uh, they were people who were majorly journal managers and editors, but were also authors, reviewers, and publishers. You can also see the journals and institutions they were a part of. If you can move on to the next slide. So some of the suggestions that came were to, uh, you know, um, to include, sub, you know, rejected submissions, uh, you know, submissions that were rejected before peer review article type uh, to again filter by admin editor, reviewer action uh, to sort by topic, uh, to, you know, sort by newest to oldest. Um, if you could move on to the next one. Uh, so for the next steps, because there were like so many um, statuses that uh, were collected and I am still collating the data on the survey uh, that we will wait for more insights to form a concrete proposal along with design explorations for submission lists. And then we will continue to do usability tests on it. Uh, I will also be undertaking some user workshops in the first quarter of next year uh, for which I will communicate with you all soon. And to solidify all the insights collected from the user research, uh, I will also be doing secondary research, which will consist of heuristic analysis, which are nothing but basic you know, rule of thumb when it comes to computer human interaction. 
uh, persona mapping and competition audit. And together, what we plan to do is bring the whole research together and like um, get it validated with internal stakeholders as we enter to the, through the process of our next releases. So in case um, you all are excited to participate or have any inputs, please reach out to me on the email ID or to Alec, Nate, or Burjana, and we'd be happy to get on a call with you. So thank you so much. Thanks, Divika. Um, that's the end of the presentation. We do have a couple of minutes here to take questions if you want to type them into the chat. And uh, while you're doing that, um, I will say we're going to post the video on YouTube. So if you think of anything you'd like to ask us afterwards, watch for it to show up on YouTube, and you're welcome to add questions in the comments there. We'll respond the same way. Um, it's been mentioned a couple of times, but I just want to reiterate that the work that we're presenting here is done by not just the PKP development team, um, but also the whole community. We have a number of folks who are helping us in uh, a thousand different ways. If it's financial, if it's uh, coding plugins, if it's contributing um, bug fixes, if it's just identifying bugs that we can then fix. This really is a community team effort, and I really do appreciate everyone's uh, contribution. I appreciate the time you've got to spend with us here. We will do this on a quarterly basis, and I'm hoping it can become a little bit less uh, slides and talking heads because we have a lot of uh, progress to get through. And then once we get this into a quarterly basis, we'll be able to, I think, uh, be focused more on specific issues and a bit of interaction. So um, stick with us for that. Um, otherwise, uh, seeing no further questions, I'd like to thank you all for your time and uh, please do stay in touch with us.